please rise and join me in prayer as we enter into the Lord's presence this morning. Father, we are so thankful for gathering us here into your presence today. And we ask, Lord, as we come to worship you, may you fill our hearts with song. May we depend upon your spirit that every word that we sing, we may do so with love, with thankfulness, with joy, that you may cover us with your faith, that you may cover us with your love, that the peace of God may guard our hearts and our minds as we worship you today. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. Please be with us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero! Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, my Savior, your name is it high, oh God, you have done great things.
Oh, 
Come search our hearts and purify our lives. We need your perfect love, we need your discipline. We're lost unless you guide us with your light. Lord Jesus, come lead us. We're desperate for your touch. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice. It is written, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. Let me read that again. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. As we continue to sing songs of worship to the Lord, let us put on the full armor of God. Let us take up the shield of faith, because with it we can extinguish every flaming arrow of the evil one. Whatever burdens that we have, whatever sins that we have to confess, whatever pain or struggle or heartache that we are enduring, let us lift up everything to the Lord, that he may increase our faith in him, that we, he may increase our faith in Jesus Christ. So let us go to the Lord today in prayer as we return, as we repent, as we seek Him. That He may be our confidence, that He may be our hope. For we see in part, but He knows all. 
Let us turn to the Lord today. Let us pray.
step, we are breathing in your grace. May we lift up our praises to you. Let us lift up our hands to you, Father. Help us to depend upon you. Increase our faith. Let faith arise in our hearts, in our songs of worship to you. And Lord, as we enter into this time of receiving your word today, May you continue to work in our hearts, continue to transform us, sanctify us, guide us to you, so that by faith we may know your truth, the resurrection power of the gospel, that as Pastor Brad preaches your word today, he may do so with the same faith, with the same power that rose Christ from the dead, that you may fill him and guide him and guard his heart against the evil one, that as he preaches your word, each and every one of our hearts may be transformed today. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your message. We thank you for the cross. Please be with us, strengthen us, empower us, help us to turn to you today. We love you, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now before we're seated, let's take some time to greet uh, everyone around us. All right, good morning. Um, this week, my Bible study teach, le, teacher, my, my Bible study leader sent me an email, and she was bring, preparing her Bible study on the book of Ephesians, and she asked me a question about salvation. And she said, hey, Brad, I'm preparing a uh, Bible study on the book of Ephesians, and I have a question about predestination. I opened up the email, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And, uh, and he said, does, does, does chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians mean when he talks about predestination, that God chooses some to be saved and others not to be saved. Of course, he was talking about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6, right? It tells us, right? Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessings in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then, can't get around this word. In love, do you notice here, before he talks about predestination... Uh, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And I told her, because one of the questions she also asked me is, are you, by the way, are you a Calvinist? I told her that Ephesians text tells us that God chooses some to be saved out of his love, but the text doesn't tell us that God, doesn't, God chooses others to be damned. It doesn't give us that. We have to go to the book of Romans. Because Romans will tell us that God chooses some to be saved and some not to be saved. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 10, 10 through 21. He said, not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it's written, Jacob I love, Esau I hated. And then he says, what then shall I say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desires or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says Pharaoh, to, to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I may display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and hardens whom he wants to harden. And then he goes on and he says, one of you will say, then why does God still blame us for not choosing him? Here's the biblical response. For who is able to resist his will? Here's the biblical resp response, verse 20. He says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some play, pottery for a special purpose and some for a common use? So I told her, I said, you got to go to Romans text to know that God chooses some to be saved and others not to be saved. And then I wrote to her and I said, you know, in the Bible, it talks about the fact that God has a choice. He's free. So he has this choice. And the choices that he makes has repercussions. And the same time, Bible tells us that we have a choice. We're free to make choice. We can choose God or not to co uh, choose God, and there is consequences. But the issue here isn't about our choice. It's actually about sovereignty. 
Does God's sovereignty overrule our sovereignty? That's the whole question. Does the Bible teach us that the God's sovereignty, okay, overrules our sovereignty? And the text is very clear. Yes, it does. Does that mean we're not responsible for our choices? We are. Is that just? He is. That's the biblical answer. And I told her, if that is what Calvinism is, I lean towards Calvinism. Now, I wanted to tell you that because I, want, I was so proud of her for sending me the email. I didn't really enjoy the writing the email, but I was so proud of her because she's doing one thing that is absolutely necessary for a Christian to grow, which is to understand their salvation. Now, we, we're continuing our series this morning titled The Gospel According to Jesus Christ. And the subject we're going to talk about again, and we've just been talking about doctrine of justification, but is faith. Because one of the things Paul is telling the Galatians is that you are not understanding the salvation that you have. Because he's going to talk about more than justification. He's going to go into sanctification. And one of the things he's going to tell them is you don't, the reason why you're struggling in your faith, reason why you're going to legalism is because you don't understand your salvation. Listen to what he says in chapter 3. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He's going to call them foolish again. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. That word crucified is in perfect tense. I'll tell you why that means something. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it is really in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles? See, he goes into sanctification, right? He talked about justification. He says, he says, now that you're living out your faith and God is giving you spiritual gifts to do miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard. It's very clear. Justification by faith alone. Sanctification also by faith alone. So also Abraham believed God and his credit to him as righteousness. Understand that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. For those who rely on faith will be blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of Lot. Now you understand why he's going to Abraham, right? Because it's the Judaizers that came to Galatia. And they said, Moses told us to obey these law. He takes them all the way back to Abraham because he's trying to say, law will never get you to righteousness. You didn't start with the law. You can't end with the law. That's his whole point. Verse 11, clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because righteous will live by faith. He's quoting Genesis chapter 15. And one of the questions you need to ask here, and I'll talk about it, is why doesn't he quote Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham was initially called? Well, I think because he's talking about sanctification. Verse 12, law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, a person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. So by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now today, as you examine Apostle Paul, help Galatians to understand salvation that they have. I'm going to answer three questions that's going to enable us to live out our salvation. So the first question, and you need to focus on this question because, you know, we've been talking about uh, justification by faith, but I'm not going to talk about de being declared righteous. I'm going to talk about living righteously. So first question is, what enables us to live righteously before God? I, I talked about being declared righteous. That's in justification. But here, we're going to talk about sanctification and get... Uh, sanctification also here. So I'm going to say, what enables to live righteously before God? Because we know in sanctification, it's 100% our effort and 100% God's effort to make us holy. And it's really amazing because right away as he opened up this chapter 3, he says, understand. You can actually see it in very first verse. You foolish Galatians. He doesn't use the word morals here, which is generally what, what they, they would have used in the word fool. He uses another word. The word here, foolish, is not saying you're not smart. It's actually saying, why are you not living up to the point that you can live up to? He uses another word here. He says, why aren't you thinking the way, why aren't you understanding? That's what he's saying. When he says, you foolish, again, in verse 3, he's used the same word. He's saying, understand. 
And then he says, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. That's a perfect tense. Why is it so important that it's a perfect tense? Because in a perfect tense in Greek means something that happened in the past has current ramifications. He's talking about living in sanctification. He's saying Christ died for you so that you'll be set free. That's what he's trying to say. Christ is crucified. It has impact for you when you live your life. And then he goes on. He says, keep understanding. He says, verse 2, he says, I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you were? He's saying, look, look, you received the Spirit by hearing. He's saying, understand. So now we can answer the question, what enables us to live righteously before God? Well, it's faith that leads to relationship with God because that's what he's going to talk about. He's going to tell us that when we believed in God, God gave us his Holy Spirit to relate to God. It's, it's really amazing. Verse 2, right? I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, by believing what you're... Well, the answer is, of course, by believing. And then he goes into sanctification in verse 5. He says it again. So again, I ask, does God give you the Spirit... And work miracle among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Well, of course, the answer is, yeah, by believing. To do what? Believe what? Receive the Holy Spirit to do what? Relate to God. He's talking about here regeneration. He's teaching us something here. That's why he keeps talking about Christ's crucif crucifixion. And then he talks about our crucifixion. And then we have risen again to do what? Relate to God. Well, what is it so significant about relating to God? You see, in the Bible, when we relate to God, we depend upon God. What he's trying to tell us is that well, you, are, you are depending on God by believing in him and focusing upon him. That's why, verse 9, he says, For those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, a man of faith. But those who rely on works of the law are under the curse. Do you notice here? What he's saying is that why, why did you believe in Christ and have relationship with Jesus? through the Holy Spirit, and go into sanctification, live your faith, and now you stop relating to God. That's why I told you during prayer meeting, people come to my office, they're like, oh, I'm really struggling, you know, uh, with my faith. And I always ask them, hey, did you have your devotional time? They're like, no, 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 you don't understand the pain that I'm in. You don't know what I'm, no, no, did you have devotion, devotional time? They're like, there you go, there goes the legalist. No, 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 that's not my point. Guys, we receive the Holy Spirit so we can relate to God, and then what do we do when we relate to God? We depend upon God. Faith leads to relationship which leads to dependence in others there's nothing we can do in our own power we didn't get saved because of our power there's nothing we can do by living out our faith in our own power it's depending upon god then god strengthens us and gives us the power it's everything is dependence 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 through the relationship with god. that's what faith is you see faith leads to not ourselves that's why your focus is so important that people come in they're like you don't understand what i'm going through i'm like yeah i do Whatever you're going through, I don't need to hear it because it's more painful than you can handle. That's the whole point. That's why you have to depend on God. You, there's no one who can save you, no one who can relieve you. There is no Savior but Jesus Christ. He is the only one. But you have to practice faith that leads to relationship. You know, what is it? It's focus. As a believer, if you want to do what God has called you to do, if you want to do supernatural things, that's what he's talking about when you receive the Holy Spirit initially, spirit, receive the Holy Spirit to do the supernatural thing. What is he saying? He's saying, no, you can never do the supernatural thing. I just finished discipleship with uh, one of the men today. And I told him, hey, what this, the, the spiritual gifts that you have is not your talent. You didn't earn it. I don't know when Christ gave it to you, but most like when you received Jesus. And the gifts that you have, it's supernatural. It's something that he has. It's, it's not something that you do because you're good at it. No, it's something you do because you're called by faith. And as you do it, even though you're not good at it, but the spirit, supernatural gifts allows you, spiritual gifts allows you to do it, that's the difference. That's what Paul is saying here. Look, you don't understand what faith is. You, you don't understand why works does not work because it gives you no focus, no relationship. So we're asking a question. What enables us to walk righteously? Before? Well, it's faith that leads to relationship. So if we struggle in our faith, okay, it's your relationship, God. Are you relating to God? Are you depending upon him? Are you, are you walking in his power? Because there's nothing you cannot do when you depend on him. That's the whole focus here. It's not. You see, what Satan does is he focuses, has us focus on our pain. Focus on our inabilities. You've always been inability. That's why I always tell you, what did you put into your salvation? Nothing. But your sin. Well, why do you think more sin will make it worse? You see why willful sin is so powerful? Because when we sin, we focus on sin, and then we will focus on work, right? That's we say, God, we won't do it. We will never do this. See, we go into the flesh. We go into the works. It should be, actually, when you sin, you should lead to God. And really, Lord, I could never overcome this before. Even now, in walking in sanctification, I could never overcome. You see, 
That's why willful sin is so powerful, because it keeps our focus away from relating to God into our own strength. We could never do it before. We will never do it now. We're always dependent upon God. It's faith, faith, faith. So we're asking what enabled us to walk righteously before God. Well, it's faith that leads to relationship with God, and then faith that leads to trusting God. Some of you are like, wait, doesn't all faith lead to trust? In fact, um, faith is trust. Yeah, but you see, when you read this text, actually faith, there are certain faith that leads to legalism or works. Now, this faith that Paul is talking about, Abraham's faith, is faith that leads to trusting God. Notice here, verse 6. So Abraham believed God, and his credit to him as righteous. And that is very significant. Because he goes to chapter 15. He doesn't go to chapter 12. Chapter 12, he called him out of Haran. He called him to go to the promised land. He was 75 years old, but he goes to chapter 15. He's 86 years old. Why? Because he's talking about walking in faith. And what he says is, that, look, 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 here, look. When he's 86 years old, God appeared to him and said, you're going to have a child. Notice verse 6. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him as right. In other words, when he was 86 years old, his body was dying. He still believed because he had relationship with God. That's his whole point. Understand that those who have faith are children of, children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And announce gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. For those who rely on faith are blessed among Abraham. A man of faith. It's really amazing. You see why he's taking him to Abraham, right? Because the Judaizers are talking about Moses. He takes them to Abraham. But he doesn't take them to chapter 12. He takes them to chapter 15. He's been walking with God for 11 years. Then he says, against all odds, I'm going to give you a child. And Abraham believed. He's saying in sanctification, even though it's difficult, it seems so impossible, God is still a God of faith. You have to believe in him, and you have to trust in him. And what makes this faith powerful is that even though the opposition, the odds were against him, even though it was unbelievable, because he had relationship with God, now he has the ability to believe. You see what growing in faith means. You see what spiritual maturity is. It's to grow. You see, Galatians thinks it's the works. That's why, look at verse, t- verse 10. It says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse... You see, I just talked about how relationship with God in faith leads to reliance upon God. But then the Galatians are actually relying on works. So for all who rely on works of the law are under the curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything in the book of the law. Clearly, no one relies on law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. And then verse 3, right? Are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of flesh? You see, here's, here's faith that leads to works. And I, th- I believe he's talking about arrogance. I believe in always the other side of pride is insecurity. See, Galatians know that they're Gentiles and they're called, and these Judaizers come, and they're always like insecure about their faith. And these Judaizers, they're not really Christians at all. They don't really have faith. Say, no, no, if you really want to walk with God, you have to believe and work. And what Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Get over your arrogance or insecurity. No, humble yourself. You have to rely on God. Same thing. Abraham relied on God, worked, walked with him for 11 years. Then he believed even more and depended on God even more. You see what dependence does? It humbles us. We know that we cannot do anything within our own power. So we are not ashamed of the fact that we cannot do anything. It's amazing. Like, you know, I, I, I counsel Christians. And you know, the number one thing that Christians are struggling with the, when I counsel them is guilt. I don't know. They walk, in, walk with God, and then they somehow think, as they're walking, that there's some sin in the path that Christ doesn't. So they work, they work, they work. They put this guilt, and it kills their faith. As though there's some sin that cannot be forgiven. And then they work, they work, they work, and they're like, I'm arrogant. I don't know. I can't, I can't stop my arrogance. I can't stop my insecurity. Well, it's because you're relying on works. You see, there's faith that leads to trust. What, is, what does it mean to lead to trust? It's to believe in God even though there's nothing to believe, even though the reality says you cannot believe. But because God's word says so, it's the ability to believe. He says, that's what Abraham did. In chapter 15, God comes to Abraham, and Abraham, Abraham, I'm your great reward. You know what Abraham says. What can you give me, Lord? I don't have a child. I'm 86 years old. What can you give me, Lord? The very thing that 
somebody else in my own house, or Eliezer, is going to get, see, Abraham didn't get what, he, what his heart really desired. And God says, no, 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 Abraham, I will bless you. I will give you a child against all odds. 11 years of not answering prayer, 86 years old, yet he believed. He's saying that's trust. Let me, let me just tell you, because I think a lot of people think trust is like when God does everything and I, I pray for everything. I remember uh, we had my, my, my parents, their dream was to move to Oak Brook, which is like a wealthy suburb. That was our goal in life in the 70s. So we finally moved in, and then my aunt came, and she prayed a spiritual prayer, and she said, everything I have ever prayed for, you answer me. And then, of course, we all cry, said, that's what it means to trust. No, it's not. That's obvious. It's just easy to trust. God answers your prayer right away. We call this spiritual immaturity. Yeah. Abraham trusted God by faith when there's no reason to trust. In fact, his body was dying. In fact, when he was 99 years old, he laughed. Yet he believed. Because God said so. That's why. Do you notice why Paul keeps saying Christ crucified, Christ crucified. Do you, can you get it in the book of Christ crucified? Do you, can you get it? Christ, well, what's, well, crucifixion is, is capital punishment. You die a cruel. Why does he keep saying that? Because he's trying to remind you there's nothing for you to be guilty about. Christ has died. So if you are struggling with some kind of guilt from the past, you're arrogant. You're unbelief. You think somehow by works. Do you notice what the, what's happening with the Galatians? They believe now that they've been walking by faith that they can go another step by doing works. It's not. You're actually falling away. Your faith must go into more and more and more with trust. Well, well, Brett, if that means, that's what it means. Does it mean that as we get more and more mature in God, we do less and less? Yeah, we do. Less and less to please God. More and more to honor God because we trust Him. Do you notice here what we do? So we no longer get mad at people if they're not appreciative. We do things that nobody would think about doing, but we're not mad if they don't reciprocate because we are growing in trust. We understand God has called us, and that's enough in itself. Do you see why? Guys, if you miss this, if you want to walk righteously with God and you don't have no relationship with God, you haven't related to God, but you, it's over. I tell people in counseling all the time, there's no sense spending time with me. I'm not a counselor. I'm a discipler. You don't have this right relationship with God. You don't want to be talking to me. So I don't listen to what you tell me. I tell you how to live your life by the power of God. If you can't do it, if you don't want it, that's why people are like, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, I know. Thank you for not wasting my time and your time. Because until we get this right as Christians, there's no supernatural power to do, enable us. There's nothing that God cannot do through us. But the point is not what God can do. The point is your faith. Will you trust in him? The same God that you trusted when you started out, when he delivered you from all the things. Now that you've been walking with him and all these new pain are coming in your life, same God that you have to trust in him and in his word. I was talking to Janice about a marriage sermon. And once again, Janice did something that I've never been asked to do before by any of my peers. Um, uh, uh, last wedding that I did, uh, they asked me to preach a little bit longer. And Janice also said it was okay to preach longer. Usually my generation is like five to seven minutes. We would appreciate it. And I told her, I said, hey, in order for me to preach, I only preach because I cannot exposit. It's if I do, I'll, I'll get into context, and my sermon will go a long time. And it'll go 30, 40 minutes, and then my wife will be mad at me, and I can't do it. See, there's a difference between a marriage sermon. But when you go into the Word, and when you look into the Word, the reason why you have to expose it is because there's context. God spoke in context of a life of a person. And that word that you believe in will deliver you if you understand the context. It's to believe. Whether you're in justification, whether you're in sanctification, whether you will go into glorification, can you imagine, right? Some of us will rise again and we'll think, wait, 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 wait. This is not the first resurrection. You understand the resur resurrection of the unrighteous will happen first. And then the second resurrection. Some of you, you know, some of us are like, we might be feel, feeling guilty, right? Dying. And we're like, wait, wait, wait. No, no, it's the second resurrection. There is no judgment in the second resurrection. Your name is written in the book of the law. You have already passed. By what? By faith. 
Even in glorification, it's by faith. It's believing in God's word and what he will deliver. This is the power of a believer. This is the power of the believer. We can do what God tells us to do because we believe. And through our relationship, God empowers us to do that which that we could never do. So for a believer, arrogance or insecurity should never be part of our lives because when Christ comes and Holy Spirit comes in our life, he can overcome. So we're asking a question, what leads us to, what enables us to walk righteously before God? Well, two kinds of faith, right? One is faith that leads us to relationship with God, a dependence upon God. And second is by, leads us to trusting God. So why, we have to answer this question, right? Why does faith enable us to live righteously before God? Because what Paul is saying is, look, if you don't have faith, you can't please God. In fact, right, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 66, right? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I, I, I was reading this verse and I was like blown away because I only think about the first part. But do you notice the second part here, right? Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Can you imagine? This is so powerful. Can you imagine? Can you imagine when you have all these struggles that comes at you, when you are tempted by all the? can you imagine if you believe that he exists? Can you imagine if you believe he exists? Can you imagine the power and that he will richly reward those who seek him? Can you imagine? Do you see what faith does? So we're asking a question, why does faith enable us to live righteous? Well, it's obvious, right? I'm just talking about word of God, right? Because it enables us to claim our promise from God. Do you notice verse 6? Because Paul's going to take us to the original promise, right? We understand chapter 11 is the saddest chapter in the Bible, right? Tower of Babel, where they're building this tower, and then they're building it without God. They want to be righteous. They want to be great without God. God confuses them at the end of chapter 11. So chapter 11 is the saddest Bible in, it's a chapter in the Bible. Chapter 12, God chooses Abraham. And then he waits 11 years. And then he makes this promise, right? And, and, and I believe when Abraham originally received it, he probably thought it was through his child Isaac, but it's really amazing because Paul restates this. This is why you need the New Testament to understand the Old Testament. You need to understand, you have to have Old Testament to understand New Testament. He restates this. And notice what he says. He says, so also Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Understand that those who have faith are children of Abraham. I don't know if Abraham got this. I think when he was going to bless him through his child, I think he thought it was going to be through Isaac. And it is indeed because Israel today is blessed through Isaac in the sense that they are a nation and they are people. But no, no, he's talking about something else. He says, Scripture for Saul. This is why you need the New Testament to understand the Old Testament. That God would justify the Gentiles by what? Works? No, faith. And I'll announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. But by what? Not by flesh, by faith. To those who rely on faith, our blessings with Abraham, the man of faith. It's really amazing what he's saying. He's taking us before Moses. He's taking us to Abraham. And he's saying, no, no, before the law was even written. And it's really amazing because if you really look at the law, because that's what the Judaizers are doing. They, they are saying, hey, you, the law is holy. Law is righteous. But it's actually, if you go into Exodus and you see when God gave the law, it's actually a default. It wasn't God's original plan. Uh, purpose. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 through 6. They come out of Egypt. They go to Mount Sinai. And this is what God says. It's amazing. He says, Moses went up to God and Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourself seen that I, what I did in Egypt and how I carried on, carried you on as eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Notice what it's amazing. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you, this is ye in the old English, okay, all of you will be for me kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You notice here the context is, is ye, it's all of them. He wants to make them priests. So God comes down, meets Moses, gives him 10 commandments, chapter 20. And he says, hey, when you come up, be careful. And notice what happens. It's, it's really amazing. And you see almost here what keeps us from walking righteously before God. Notice what here in chapter 20, verse 18 to 21. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, this is how God comes. He comes. People think when Jesus comes back, it's going to be like, hey, Jesus. No, no, no. He's going to come. Divine warrior. 
His mouth is going to open. He's going to kill people. It's, it's, it's amazing. When his thunder and lightning heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. And then notice what they said. They stayed at the distance. And you can almost see Genesis 6 through 9 here. And said to Moses, speak to us yourself. We will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. You see, fear, fear, fear. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sin. Now, I need you to understand this. We're like, what keeps us walking right? It's fear. Fear of God. Not in the sense that God keeps us from sinning, but fear of God in the sense that our sins is going to keep us away from God. This is fear. The people remain at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And then that God gives law. Law is default. And you read that and you're like, wait, wait, wait. When is law given when we skip relationship with God? It's really cool. That's why when you sin willfully, do what you want, then all of a sudden you go into legalism. That's why when you have no relationship with God, you go into legalism. It's actually really amazing when you kind of observe people that struggle with legalism. It's, it's really, really interesting. They have no relationship with God. Or the relationship they have, this is why we have Discipleship 300, is a worldview of themselves. I tell you all the time, right? When I first met the Lord, I thought that God was like, you know, someone who was in heaven with a hammer. I thought God was like my dad. He would judge me, and I could never make him happy. That's, that's, that's what I saw. My dad was a perfectionist. I saw God as a perfectionist. I had to be delivered to see God as who he is through the word of God. That's what we do in Discipleship 300. See, some people see God the way they want to. No, no, you have to see it through the scripture. And what you realize, every time when you in scripture, whether it's Abraham, Moses, or even the Galatians, Every time, I mean, we're like, oh, you know, Galatians seem like, oh, they weren't that far away, but they're actually people 2,000 years ago. Every time you see these people of the, uh, uh, in the Bible, what you see is that they skip relationship, they go into legalism. You see why faith enables us, right, to, to walk righteously before God. Because if you go into legalism, it's over because everything is fear and guilt. It's the same coin. It's, it's just opposite side. When you walk in fear, then there's guilt. Because it's never good enough. It's always fear and guilt, fear and guilt, fear and guilt. Lose focus. No relationship with God. And you have relationship with yourself and whatever system that you walk with. It's amazing. I believe Americans pay almost trillion dollars on counseling. I wish I could just teach them. Forget all the non-believers. Like I can't help them. But the Christians, I, I, relationship. No, not, not felt relationship. And then uh, guilt, true guilt. If you willfully have sinned, you should feel true guilt, not felt guilt or uh, false guilt. And then you should have true repentance. Right? I tell people all the time because, you know, people tell me, I, you know, when I worship God, when I go back to God, you know, I have this, phenom- this condemnation, right? A lot of people tell me all the time, Friday, you know, when I go there, I feel all this guilt, right? That's Satan's ploy. What's the response? Scripture. Memorize scripture. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. It may benefit those who listen. Why is it important? You counteract it. And then all of a sudden, the oppression goes away. In fact, in fact if you memorize like three, four, five times. I talk about this story all the time. I was at the gym. This is like, you know, 10 years ago when they used to have, all the women were wearing what's called a sports bra. It's the same. Sports bra, bra. I don't think you should wear that. But, you know, if I say anything, of course, I didn't say anything. And then I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to be looking at this. But it's there. So I, I memorized Proverbs chapter 4, right? Guard your heart above all else is wellspring of life. Guard your heart above all else, wellspring of life. Guard your heart. By the third, first, third time I'm memorizing it, I don't even see the sports bra. I see myself working out. Amazing. The, the scripture is power. Why? why? Why does the word of God enable us? Well, it gives us faith. In what? In God who helps us, who empowers us, enables us to do that which he has called us to be. You see, guys, if you leave scripture, you are unsure whether God can do anything through you. If you stay in scripture, you have faith of Abraham. Against all lies does not matter. Because faith, that's what faith is about. It's, it's about believing and trusting God before it actually comes to be. Faith is not believing in God when you already have it. It's, it's about something that's about to come, hasn't come, but because of God, it will come. That's what faith is. 
That's why if you keep having faith, you grow in trust. Because you know what he did in the past. You know what he did. You knew just by faith he saved you. Like in my case, he transformed me from being a drug dealer. In my case, he transformed me from somebody who's never really read a book until I was 27 years old to loving. He changed me. He transformed me. He allowed me to write all of these things that I could never write before. I, you know, I was reading Francis Schaeffer, and, and he, was, he was saying that when he went to college, um, he, actually his son was writing about this, and he, he, when his father went, Francis Schaeffer is a great ph- Christian philosopher, and he said when he wrote his first essay for the Engl- English Composition 100, his, his professor told him, your level of writing is not at college freshman level. And I was like, me too. <laughs> me too. When I wrote it, you know, they said no. I was so amazed when God told me to write about all this stuff. Uh, really? Yeah. But it wasn't really about me. It's about what he has called me to do and then doing it because I have faith. And then now I look back on it, I trust, because even though some people don't think very well. It doesn't really matter because God has done it. Actually, Lois uh, edits my, my uh, discipleship manual, and she says, Pastor Brad, it makes no sense when you're writing it. And then it changes. <laughs> well, well, maybe God's doing it. Because I would never write on my own. I don't even... I don't talk about this, but, um, you know, I always tell my children, right, because I'm like, Daddy got accepted to Wheaton College, which was number one uh, liberal arts Christian school, and I got accepted to U of I, and then and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the tr- really, the truth of the matter is when I wrote my uh, application to Wheaton College, it was five pages. I don't know why they asked so many questions, like, you know, are you going to drink? Are you going to dance? You know, you got to write all these things out. I don't remember Honestly, what I wrote, I know that my wife edited it. I don't, I don't have the final copy, but my wife <laughs> edited it. And I'm pretty sure it was not what I wrote. It somehow changed, right? And I, I, I know that it's because of my wife whom God sent into my life. Well, God told me to, you know, apply, so I did. You see? Once you start having a relationship with God, you, you begin to understand. It's faith. It's God. Dependence upon God. So we're asking, what, why? Why does faith enable us to walk righteously before God? Because in faith, we, it, we're able to claim our promise from God. And then there's another reason, which is that in faith, it enables us to claim our redemption. Guys, I need you to like underline this. Redemption. You know what it means to be redeemed, right? You know what it means, right? It's to pay a price for something you buy back. Notice here, Galatians 13, it's 313, he says, Christ redeemed us. This is why you should never be guilty about anything you've done in the past, if you believe in Jesus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who on a pole. And then he's going to repeat it. Because Galatians keep missing it. He said, he redeemed us. You just said it in verse 13. Why? He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to us, the Gentiles, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Do you, do you notice here? He's saying, look, look, what faith does is it reminds us that God bought it back. Christ finished. Christ crucified. It's done. You know, people ask me about credit card, and I always tell them, you know, if you, if, you, if you follow my directions in credit card, you can save 80%. And I'm always like, but if you feel like the travel industry needs your money and airlines need, you don't have to do it. Just pay full price because you, you're worried about the economy, and, you know, go ahead and pay full price. Why? Because the points will pay the price. Guys, do you see? It's, it's like going to purchase an airline ticket, and then you're like, well, i like to do it again. I don't know why, because they need my money. You can do it. It's the same thing with guilt. Christ redeemed us. He paid for it. That's why he died on the cross. That's why Paul reminds us, right? Verse 14, he, de- he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that 
by faith we might receive the promise of God. He d- redeemed us so that we would walk by faith and walk righteously before him. He redeemed in others. He didn't have to. And the price is paid. It's paid once and for all. You have a choice to pretend like it didn't get paid because you're like, well, you know what? I'm not going to believe. That's your choice. But if you believe that, you won't walk in power and righteously before God because it's never been about what you've done. It's about what you believe. And when you believe in Christ and he died, he died a cruel death. People are like, well, you know, is that all you're going to ever talk about Christ crucified? Yeah, because that's all we need. That's all you need. God has never been happy with what we have done since Adam and Eve fell. Never been happy. Never. But he's fully satisfied in us because we are in Christ Jesus. He has has been crucified and he has bought us back. We're fully paid for. Whatever the price is, Whatever that price of guilt and, and, and condemnation, whatever we have done, fully paid back by the blood of Jesus Christ. So he repeats it again and again and again. What he's trying to say is, no, 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 no. See, faith enables us to claim our redemption. So if you're feeling guilty and guilt is haunting you, you need more faith, not more counseling. If you want to be delivered by your pain that is haunting you through guilt and shame, you need more faith. Because faith will deliver us to Christ who will give us the power to be healed because that's our redemption. That's why he reminds us of Abraham. Just as Abraham, though he didn't have everything going for him, though he was 86 years old, he had to be promised. And he believed God. And he had a child. And yes, he lived a tough life. Yet he walked just like Abraham. That's the promise we have. Not because we are somehow biologically related to Abraham. Because none of us here are Jews but because of Christ crucified who redeemed us. Oh, I love book of Galatians. By faith. Not by works, by faith. By, you, you mean to tell me by believing in it, I can be free from all my guilt? Yeah. I, I, can I just tell you, not only guilt today or guilt of the past, but guilt in the future. You mean to tell me that if I have faith in Christ, that whatever wrong that I might do, well, isn't it then, isn't it true then, that God is really taking a chance with us, right? Isn't he really, if if he can just do anything, remember that's what Galatians were saying, isn't it believing Christ, isn't it it leading us among the sinners, right? Right? That could be, you you mean to tell me, if if God forgives me for everything I've done, no, 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 and then you know, what does he say? If you're converted, if you're transformed, and when you relate to God, you realize what? God is enough. There are things that only God can fulfill in your heart. And once you taste that taste, this is why Paul is writing the book of Galatians. Because they're Christians. And walking in works, they are so miserable. That's why, you know, like when the praise team sings, when we go to our prayer meeting, when we spend our time with God, or just walking in Christ. I mean, I tell this to people all the time. I'm a, co- I'm a former cocaine dealer. You know what, co- what happens when you, when you do cocaine? It, re- it releases endorphins. You feel good. I mean, good. Like good, really, really. Like you feel like a Superman. And then you d- feel that for about an hour, and then for the next eight hours you suffer because you don't have it anymore. And then when I converted, I was like shocked. I was shocked at the power and the contentment, the spirit. I was shocked. I was like, wait, wait, wait. The equation doesn't make sense. If this is what Christianity is, do you, do you notice here, Galatians have lost this because they're walking in their guilt and shame. Works. And, and he's saying, no, 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 you got the wrong concept. Go back to your faith, and then remember, when you walk in sanctification, walk by faith. In glorification, glorification, it will be by faith. Faith, faith, no other works. Faith, faith, and then God comes, and when you connect, and then I tell people all the time, when you have faith, you must connect. 
That's why, you know, I, I get called all the time. You're such a legalist. You're always asking us, how many times do you do devotion? I ask you all the time. If you come there, how's your devotion? I, you know, I, I know like, you know, like, there goes the legalist again. No, no, that's not why. Because your faith must lead to relationship. And your relationship must lead to dependence. You ever have, like, sin in your life, and you go and relate to God? What happens? That sin is right before you. Right? When you have, like, sin, when you are trying to willfully do something, right? Sometimes I get really upset at my wife, and I don't feel like being nice. And I have my devotional time. It's right before me. And God always confronts me and says, you, you can do it, but you, you know, you'll suffer. It won't be good for you. And then I'm like, Lord, I don't have the strength. I can't believe that unreasonable woman. And the guy's like, no, it's you. You have no faith. You have no reliance. You have no repentance. You! And then he changes it, and then you come out. And it's amazing. You go into prayer, one, you yell at somebody, you come out of prayer thankful that you didn't get yelled at. It's really, I, this, this transformation is amazing. But that's what faith does. Faith, right? Without, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? Because when you have faith, you connect to God, you rely upon God, and you can do the things that you could never do in your own strength. Church planting? Why would you ever church plant? Why would you ever church plant? Stay in. It's safer. But by faith, because God calls you. Then you rely upon God, and then you're like, oh my gosh, what has God done? It's amazing what he does. It's amazing. Well, it's his power. It's his ability. It's about him. It's about Christ crucified. Never about us. When we get married, right? I mean, uh, my daughter was asking me this week, you know, Dad, when, was, when did you first start dating? And I told her when I was like 17, and then she was really shocked. because She was like, oh, I would have thought that you would have dated earlier. But you don't know. I mean, we all grow up, we all, you know, I, I was a geek, junior high, wore the same, same pants for a whole semester, I was getting made fun of, I mean, I never knew that somebody would like, like me, and then when my wife liked me, I was like really, really surprised, I couldn't believe she would really like me, and then she was surprised that she would like me too, <laughs> right, and we're singles, like we're so insecure, like, and then all of a sudden, right, Christ gives us, right, and then we're amazed, right, and then when, when it doesn't work out, we blame ourselves, as though something, no, it's, it's, God, it's, you see, without faith, without relationship with God, without dependence of God, nothing makes sense. And then if you put yourself in the middle, you lose it. Works always drives you to failure. And that's what he's talking about. So we're asking a question, why? Why, why, why does faith enable us to walk righteously before God? Well, it allows us to claim our promise, but also our redemption from God. So we need to ask, answer one more question. How? How do we live out our faith salvation by faith. Let me give you three ways. One is by understanding that to live righteously is to live by faith. Let me repeat that again. By understanding that to live righteously is to live by faith. If we can understand this, we would stop judging one another. Galatians 3, 1, right? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, right? It's not morals, right? And before your very eyes, Christ Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified, perfect tense. Something that up in the past has present ramification. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? I, I think he's clearly telling us, right? If you want to walk righteously before God, it is by faith. So now it makes sense why C.S. Lewis says the greatest job you have to do every morning, and this is why when I read him, I realized I'm not a legalist for insisting that you have devotion. He said every morning when you wake up, the world comes at you like a wild animal. The Christian's job is to push that back and see another reality, well, reality of faith, Christ Jesus walking by faith. So Henry Nouwen says... That if you only have 30 minutes in a day, divide it up into six different five-minute portions and make sure you connect to God. Because it's not just enough to be in the morning. Connect to God. Connect to God. Every time you connect to God, you're righteous because of Christ Jesus. No other works. No guilt. No, no fear because of Christ Jesus. All right? And then second is by realizing that without faith, you will never please God. 
right? Verse 10, right? For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Here, guys, if you, are, if you think that if you do A plus B, then you'll please God, over. Because righteous will live by faith. No works. Well, I think this also applies to human beings. I had to learn this about in my own father. I could never make him happy. Because you know why? He was not happy. So I had to go into my 40s and realize I'm never going to make him happy. And God was reminding me, it's okay. Because you make me happy. Because of Christ Jesus. You see, you will never, you have to realize this, you will never please God by works. So if you think if you do A plus B, then you'll make it, you got to throw that out. Whatever system that you walk with, if that's your system, it's not scriptural. He's clearly telling you, you cannot be justified by works. I don't know how much more clearly he can say it. He says, if you are trying to justify by curse, uh, by, by the law, you are under a curse. In other words, there's no hope for you. It's up to you how you live your life, but uh, you need to know, you cannot be righteous before God. You cannot please God without faith. And one more, by daily seeking God so that you can live by faith. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. You see what he's saying, right? Christ became that which that we should have suffered. In other words, all the suffering that you're trying to do. Sometimes I talk to people and they're like, you don't know what I'm suffering through. And then I'm like, I don't want to know, but can you give it to Jesus? Because it doesn't really help. I mean, we live in a world, we think that if we give our sin to somebody else, that they enjoy it or somehow. It doesn't, guys. It's a grace. So people are like, do you know? I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't want to know. You're making it hard for me. But you don't know how hard it is. Yeah, but it'll get harder if you tell me. No, no, tell Jesus. Right? Now, you can share for the purpose of deliverance. Right? When you repent and when you share that with another, we call that testimonial, that can help. But this raw lack of faith pain, everybody has it. Verse 14, he redeemed us. In order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith you might receive the promise of the Spirit. And we did. We have a relationship. You see why um, I always tell you to come to prayer meeting? Do you see? I told you I was talking to a friend of mine who was saying for him it's 80-20, right? 80% is individual relationship with God and 20% is with with, with, with the church, with the group. of, And I told them, no, it's, for me, it's 80% with the church and 20% on my own. Because I, I, I don't skip Tuesday and Friday unless, you know, I'm away. It's not because, uh, you know, Mr. Spiritual has to pray. No. I always hit a wall. Like, Monday, I can't pray. Tuesday, I start praying. But it's not the same as it was on Friday. And Saturday, and it's not the same. Then I go and lead prayer, and then I, we pray together, and the power comes. And you know what the power is? Power isn't like, oh, you know, I can you know, jump over. You know, you see my vertical. It's like that much. The power is I can connect to Christ and know that he knows me, and I know him, and he knows w- what I am. Then I go to Wednesday, and by Thursday, I'm like, oh, I need it again. So Friday, I come, and then, you know, They start singing, and then I start connecting with God. And power comes again enough for me on Sunday. And then by Sunday morning, I'm still, like, desperate. I'm like, I need. And then they lead praise. We worship together. And then he connects me and then gives me enough till Tuesday. It's almost like that's the way I work. Why why is this so important? Because prayer is communication with God. It connects me. So if you take that out, it's very hard. And there's only few people. I actually, I don't know anybody. If you are one, you can tell me that you don't need to go to any prayer meeting. You just pray on your own. It's enough. I don't know anyone. Maybe you are that person. And you can tell me, and then I can use you next week as an example of dishonesty. Um, it's hard. God's design, right? That's why the church, right? You understand, right? Right? Church, right? Right? Gates of Hades will not overcome. You, you understand why Jesus gave the church to someone like Peter. You understand, right? I will build my church. 
You see why it's the hope of the world. I will build my church, and gates of Hades will not open. Why? Because it's God's ecclesia. That's actually the Greek word. God's called out assembly standing together for God in response to God and against the world. They are standing together, and where two or more of us gather together, there will Christ be. So there's more power when we come together, and Christ sits among us, and that, that you can't replace that. Now, you can somehow, on your own, sometimes, in God's grace, get that, but without a great church. That's why, I like, you know, um, I'm about to go on a trip, you know, because my sabbatical, I have a month, and then I've been asking my son, and then, I don't know. Sam doesn't, I don't think Sam likes to spend that much time alone with me. I do, but I don't know if Sam does. Reminds me of somebody else in the house. So I always say, Gracie, you are my default. Um, you can come. I'll, I'll take you on the trip if Sam doesn't. And she has no problem. She's like, okay, Dad. If he doesn't want to go, I will go with you. But wherever we go, I want to make sure there's a church. Because she knows. 80-20, she knows. Wherever city that we go to, she knows. Without assembly of God coming together, Connecting with he, she knows to walk in faith by alone, by herself alone is impo- even with her dad is impossible. We have to go worship. We have to pray. We have to pray. We have to connect to God's community, and that gives us faith that leads to relationship, that leads to dependence, and frees us and to walk with power. Let's let's pray together, Lord. Thank you for Wicker Park. Thank you for calling our church to uh, plant churches. We are not afraid. Of a new territory, lack of number, we are not afraid. Because everything that we are, you determine. Everything we will be, you determine. And we are children of Abraham, proclaiming our promises that you've given to Abraham now to us. We are people of faith who walk with faith depending upon you. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We will now enter the time of giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. You can give on the app. You can give through Zell, or if you've brought a physical offering, you can leave it in the basket as it passes by. Let us now stand and sing in response to the message as we seek righteousness by faith in Christ alone, as we receive his power with one voice, as one body, as God's church. Let us sing to the Lord.
Please remain standing for closing prayer. For the cross. And thank you for the salvation that we have. And thank you for your word. All of it. All the word. Every single word pointing to one person. Christ. And when we look at Christ, we look at him crucified and resurrected. So that we would walk in freedom and in power. So now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of the Father and fellowship of His Spirit be with this community now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, new community. It's been such an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be able to worship with everyone here today. So glad that each and every one of you could make it. And uh, I just want to ask that after the announcements, please stick around for a time of fellowship. There are going to be refreshments in the back. It's going to be some time to just get to know everyone around here. If you're a newcomer, it'd be great to get to know you more as well. Just a couple short announcements. We have Discipleship 100 class today at 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. at West Loop. So if you are a newcomer, if you are considering uh, becoming a member or you just want to know more about our church, feel free to sign up on the app. Feel free to reach out to Pastor Frank. You have to go to West Loop if you want to do that, but uh, just, just uh, letting you know. And there will be more Discipleship 100 classes in the future, so uh, just putting that out there. Uh, there's the Breakthrough Annual Christmas Store, as P Pastor Frank mentioned uh, at prayer meeting on Friday. And uh, as mentioned before, that is happening this upcoming Saturday on the 16th from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. at Breakthrough Family Plex. There are limited spots available, um, but if you want to serve, if you want to help out, feel free to reach out to Pastor Frank, sign up on the app. Uh, make sure you get that marked in your schedule. Uh, a reminder that on the 24th, and or uh, Christmas Sunday is on the 24th. There will be a celebration, a fellowship, and a potluck uh, after 9 o'clock service <laughs> that Sunday at West Loop. So make sure you sign up for that. And just a reminder that on the 24th and the 31st of this month, the last two Sundays, we will only have 9 o'clock service at West Loop. So make sure to mark your calendars. Make sure to go to West Loop at 9 o'clock for Sunday service. Otherwise, we, have our we don't have Bible study this week. No Bible study this week. We do have open prayer, so make sure to uh, try to come out to those, as Pastor Brad mentioned. We hope to see you there on Tuesdays or Fridays from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Otherwise, we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Christmas.